Hey everybody. I was supposed to be in Toronto for the conference, but um, my uh, travel agent made a mistake and uh, my plane tickets got cancelled about one week before the departure, so I won't be here. And this is a uh, pre recorded uh, talk. But I will actually be doing a live QA session right after this. So I will still be able to be present, but this is, you know, pre recorded. Sorry about that. So, uh, what I want to talk about is um, actually not what I am building. But before we go into that, um, the um, one notice is that. There's a uh, QA website for the end of the talk, and you can go to the QA link at the top right, and that link should be able to give you a text field that you can ask questions while I'm talking about this. And at the end of this presentation, I will be um, answering those questions. So um, the topic of this talk is actually not either, which is what we're building. What I want to actually talk about is uh, I want to uh, convince you guys to actually uh, build your own distributed networks. And I want to make the case that it is actually not that hard. It's actually quite fun. And if you have, if you have a mental framework that you can uh, approach the question, and if you ask for the questions that um, that I pose, you should have the basic skeleton of a uh, distributed network that you can actually go and build. So, um, to give you a little bit of a context, and uh, I will be effectively only talking about what I'm building in the context of the questions that I will talk about, because I had to ask the same questions to myself and respond to those things. And I will um, talk about my answers so that if you find it useful, you can uh, take from my answers and build you know, your own thing. So effectively, what I'm building is a uh, ephemeral, auditable, private mass communication tool. And in reality, it looks something like Reddit. And it's more like Reddit plus with a ephemeralized like Snapchat. So um, it is a flawed network. And what that means is that all of the data goes to all of the computers in the network. And that also allows me to effectively do away with the global shared state. That means I don't have to have a distributed consensus. And lastly, I actually discard data as it gets too old. The main benefit is privacy, because if you delay the data, then you know it won't be accessible anymore. But the second benefit is yeah, I can actually work with a fixed amount of space. And that's useful, because if you have a blockchain network, then the size of that network will grow indefinitely. And uh, this is obviously open source, and you can look at the GitHub link to see what I'm doing. And I am planning to launch uh, around the end of August. So this is effectively how it looks. Um, there was not much about design in this presentation. I don't want to talk about it too much, and the design is in, in a work in progress. But um, you can effectively design it however you want. You know, it's not one of the questions that I'm going to talk about today. Tell me, um, I am I'm a designer and engineer. Uh, my last job, I was at a design lead at Facebook. And uh, I quit in February to focus full time on this. And I am actually pretty close to launching it at this point, so it's coming to a close. And uh, before Facebook, I was working at Google as a designer again. And before that, I actually built the uh, first version of Ader um, in 2013. So I was actually thinking about uh, these questions for um, pretty, pretty close to about a decade at this point. So, where should we actually build these 
mass communication. This centralized mass communication tools. Because the fundamentally speaking, um, the uh, current mass communication tools we have are all centralized. And with that, effectively, they are pretty abusive towards its users. And it's not really about a specific uh, mass communication tool that we have. Um, it can be anything. The problem is with the centralization, not specific instances of these tools, because centralizing communication gives the owner of that platform such a massive amount of power that it is almost impossible to not use it badly. That's why, you know, it has to be decentralized, not, you know, creating yet another uh, platform that people can move on to, and that gets bad in the next decade or so. So the people who actually build these things, it has to be us, because there was not so much of a um, connection between like people who can actually do these things, and people who can actually have an intense incentive to do so. And we need to do it in such a way that it doesn't create massive bills for infrastructure and it can still scale. And this is important because if you don't have the power um, to uh, effectively monetize it, then what will happen is that you won't actually make that much money. And if it depends on infrastructure, then, you know, somebody has to pay those bills. And it has to be that the bills are actually effectively non-existent. And the second thing is that it has to be privacy sensitive. And uh, if people like us like don't actually build these things, there will eventually be a point in time that people who will build these things will be less um, interested in privacy than you know what we would otherwise build. And this is effectively a list of tips that I have compiled. And my hope is that uh, it will help you build your own, you know tool that people can actually use. So this is the index of the things that I want to talk about. And uh, this is a list of questions. And if you actually be able to answer these questions, you should have a skeleton, a blueprint of the network that you can actually go and implement. This is effectively a, a lay of the land. And unless you actually have an answer to these things, you will eventually have to solve them at some future point in time. So uh, I will be posing the question, I will be giving an answer to that question, and I will still be talking about how I actually handled that question in the context of my own map, so that you should be able to see all three of these things in the same bucket. So the first thing is persistence. That uh, you need to effectively decide on whether you want to keep the data permanently or make it ephemeral. And this is a really important question because um, sometimes you actually do want to keep the data. For example, in the context of financial transactions, the value of data is actually independent of the uh, time that is passing. Because what happens is that um, you need those old transactions to be able to validate new transactions. In this case, you should definitely pick a blockchain. But um, if your data and the cost looks something like this, and if the value of your data is actually you know, getting less and less as the time goes on, then um, that is a little bit of a problem with the blockchain because you will effectively be carrying a lot of data that effectively has no value in the end. That's a problem because that will make uh, everything much lower and you will be paying the cost of this arbitrarily increasing data. And that is going to be um, a problem because, you know, that means as your network, you know, gains traction, it will be uh, harder and harder to adopt. My proposal, uh, my pitch is effectively that if this is your case, you're, even if you if you do not need a uh, if you do not need to retain the old data, you can actually get rid of the requirement to use a blockchain, and in exchange you will gain a lot of speed, a lot of resilience, and a lot of privacy because the data will disappear over time. 
And uh, this is a comparison uh, in the blockchain. Uh, you effectively have blocks that the system the, uh, needs to be able to uh, agree on, and that block gets frozen in time and used as a source for the next block. In, uh, in the classical distributed systems, uh, this is effectively based on uh, the older generation of stuff like BitTorrent and Nutella or, um, or tools that actually confirm that timeline is that uh, as long as you have most of the data, you can actually validate singular instances of data instead of blocks and that means you do not have to have your own network in a walk step so that you do not actually have to agree on anything. So the uh, second question is that um, assuming that you can actually get away with not having to uh, persist data forever, you need to determine how long you want to keep it. So um, the second uh, interesting thing about that is that having data available and distributed are two separate things. Having it distributed is expensive. Having it available is not that expensive. And the way that I'm doing that is um, the network head on the right side is actually the actively distributed part of my network. And uh, the left side network memory is only passively available at power request. So what that means is um, if somebody comes into the network and uh, ends up you know, getting the data, the only data that guy needs to get is just the last two weeks. What it does is that um, it reduces the time uh, to be considered fully mature. And that means nobody has to download six months of data because that's going to be extremely expensive in, in bandwidth and in disk space. And the second thing is um, people can actually have different storage spaces available. Some people might be able to give you tangible amounts of space to work with some people will give you 20, 300 megabytes. And the difference between those things is going to set how long the network memory is. If you fix the minimum allowed amount of data to two weeks, the actively distributed amount, then what you can do is that you can set it as the minimum uh, threshold. That means before, after that, you actually don't have a responsibility to distribute it. That means effectively people can, you know, choose whatever they want, however, however much history that they want to keep. And um, the second issue, the second question that I have is uh, you need to determine uh, what your graph and topology is. That means you have to come up with your objects and the actions that these objects can take on top of each other. So uh, the way that I'm doing is that I have six objects that I have determined, boards, threads, posts, words, keys, and states. And I have a map of these relationships. What it does is that it doesn't, uh, it gives me uh, a general sense of how much of the network is going to be taken by this specific object. For example, in my case, uh, I will have I have a lot of votes, and a vote is actually very much that valuable in its own. So what I'm doing is I'm actually deleting votes after uh, at, after the network had after two weeks because it doesn't really matter after a vote is counted. And you can do these kind of optimizations as long as you have a bracket of time that you determine everything is available. After that bracket, you can actually start to selectively delete the types of objects that you have based on the value of these graph nodes and vertices. And that means you can actually optimize the amount of space for uh, the maximum amount of value. The third question that I have for you is that you need to come up with a uh, data distribution model. Does everybody get the full copy of the whole network 
uh, just the parts that they want to follow. So both of these are actually valuable options and you can choose both of these, but it does have some uh, drawbacks and benefits. So if everybody gets the full copy of the network, the good thing is uh, for any node, any other node is going to be the same. It doesn't matter who he connects to, because they will, at least in theory, will have the same amount of data. And you can connect to anybody to, you know, actually do a sync. So the big drawback is this. Um, nodes will actually be holding data that they are not interested in. That means um, the amount of value that that node gets from the data is just a subset of that data that the guy is interested in. And in general, this needs more disk space. The second option is that everybody gets a piece of the pie that they want. So the good thing about that is that um, for every specific node, the uh, data that they have is optimized for uh, what they want. But the flip side is that they cannot actually see the data that they, uh, mm. they want to follow. What this means is that uh, they also don't have like a way to know what they don't know. So if they actually need to uh, join another uh, board or another part of the network, they have to first discover it. But they are not getting the data, so that discovery will be harder than usual. The second problem is that finding content is tricky because it needs global indexes, because not everybody has the same data, you need to be able to find which parts of the data that you actually need to, you know, put on which node. And you can do something like BHT, distributed hash table, but those things have their own problems, and they will fail on their hash own. So you have to fix that problem. And uh, most of the networks that actually use the structure ended up using super nodes, which is a solution to this problem, but uh, it makes the system less decentralized. So the way that I'm doing it either is that um, as long as you have enough space to uh, have the network head within the memory, you get all of the data. But if the data that if the space that you have is actually less than it takes to get you know the green portion, it switches to the scaled mode, and in the scaled mode, it only starts to track the things that you actually want to see. But this is kind of a degraded mode for me, and whenever the memory pressure becomes less, it will switch back to the mode that con con collects most of the information again. So the third thing is the edge case of missing and late data. And these things actually matter a lot because this will happen. Distributed networks with consolidated consensus to allow all the flood, and that's a probabilistic delivery method. And the first case is the missing data. What this gives me is that um, if you miss get objects missing, then those objects will hide their children, even if you know, even if you don't, if even if you have them. And uh, an example is this. If you miss, if you if your thread is missing in this context, the posts in that thread cannot possibly be visible because you have a hole in your graph. So one way to solve this problem, and the way that I'm solving is this: when uh, you're doing a diff, when you're syncing with a node, uh, and you have a new data, what you do is that with the new data that you have, you actually send the whole branch of the graph, not just the new data. So when somebody receives data, what happens is that uh, everybody um, that receives that part is actually getting the whole branch. So it cannot possibly be missing data because you're getting the full chain that needs to make that post visible. So this trade-off is that um, this will actually cause you to use more mapless, but I'm optimizing that by using a uh, hash lookup. So if the thread or the build in this context is actually um, already present, I don't download that data. And the second thing is the late data. And this is kind of interesting because what this does is that um, it actually has this problem in which uh, it can cause forks 
in the timeline. An example is this. When you have an admin, let's say that admin makes the user P a mod, and then the guy, the admin, decides that user P is not a good fit, and he makes him a non-mod. And uh, at T3, the uh, user P, which became non-mod, maliciously released a delete to write a request. And um, this is a problem, because what can happen is if uh, some part of the network doesn't receive the signal that makes a uh, user P a non-mod, uh, they will actually apply that malicious request and they will delete the thread. That creates a fork in the timeline. So um, the solution that I found to this issue is this. Whenever uh, the, um, the, the delayed request comes to the fork, what happens is um, it gets it, it's able to be merged back into the same timeline because the delete event can be reverted. So the solution is uh, the fact that um, all of the actions that um, that is present in the network is actually reversible. So anything can be revert reverted, and if a new data that comes in, um, that new data will actually be able to change the interpretation of the old data. So one gotcha in this is um, when you do this, you need to be aware of the fact that um, when user P loses the more rights, everything that user P has done is averted back, not just from that point in time. So it is effectively a stateless immutable system and that forces everybody to converge on the same timeline. So the, third, the fifth thing is networking. And this is important because this is a question, this is a question that allows you to effectively be able to control who gets which data and make sure that you're not creating closed loops that get cut off from the rest of the network. So um, effectively the naive approach is you know, to find and connect at random and that means you will effectively be hitting everybody that you find. The benefit is that it's simple to implement. The trade-off is that you can get too many inbounds and outbounds and you can get unlucky and hit an hour long streak of non-connectable users that will cut off you cut cut you off from the network for like an hour. The more predictable but more complex approach is to come with neighborhoods. That means uh, every node comes out with a, a group of neighbor nodes that they regularly connect to, and sometimes a new node is injected to that neighborhood, and an old node is removed from the neighborhood. So it looks something like this at T0, you have 10 nodes, from T0 to T9, you hit every one of them at every minute, and at T1, the oldest node is ejected, and the newest node is added to the neighborhood, and it repeats. So the pattern looks something like this. So that means you will actually be hitting uh, the nodes that you know for 90% of the time and the new nodes about the 10% of the time. This is actually useful because it saves bandwidth. Hitting a node that you already synced with is actually a lot cheaper than um, hitting a node that's completely new to you because there was no such thing as um, Basically, you could not actually show the state between node A and node B because there is no global state. So when you hit a node, you actually have to do a full index scan. And this actually reduces the cost of that to a trivial amount. So the sixth and the last thing is that you have application level concerns. And this is actually the end of the presentation. And these are higher level but in almost any sort of distributed network, you have to be able to deal with these problems. So I will talk about this uh, briefly. So the problems that you will have is spam, moderation, dealing with mobile devices, and unique usernames.
The first spam, this is obvious, everybody will try to spam you. And the way that I'm solving this problem, attempting to solve this problem, is that I'm using a proof of work function and everything requires a proof of work. It seems to be um, it seems to be working, but uh, let's see what happens with the network scales. The other thing is uh, the problem of moderation. And any mass communication effort without an ability to moderate, uh, whether by some single person or by the community, is effectively useless because it will be taken over by spam. And moderation is uh, prone to misuse and censorship and people actually being, you know, they have, uh, they can have ego problems if they become moderators. So the moderation needs to be able to be controlled by the users at some point. And the way that I'm solving it is that uh, the modes can be collected and impeached and mode actions are reversible as I talked about it. And every user ultimately controls their own mode list. I think this is a good solution. But I don't want to um, talk about this as the solution because it remains to be seen how this will actually work in practice. The mobile devices. This is more of a technical concern, and the problem here is that um, the mobile devices will have uh, not enough bandwidth, CPU, or uh, you know energy in terms of battery to participate in the network. And uh, if somebody shuts down the app, then it just Dies on that device. The way that I'm solving is that I have the concept of a front end and the back end, and it looks effectively like an uh, IMAP and SMTP servers. And the mobile devices are actually just front ends, and the desktop and laptops are back ends and front ends in the same bucket. So that means somebody can actually run a back end for mobile devices. The last thing is unique names, and the problem with this is that this is a general, um, general sort of a fundamental problem, and um, if a name is human meaningful and decentralized, it can't be secure. If it's decentralized and secure, it can't be human meaningful. This is called the Zucker's Triangle. And the, uh, the way that I'm solving this is that I'm actually choosing to be secure and decentralized but not necessarily human meaningful. What this means is that I'm actually using the hashes of the uh, public keys that present that represent the users as a layer of human meaningfulness on top of this. What I'm doing is um, I have um, certificate authorities in the system, and these are actually completely optional, and it. You know, you don't actually have to use this. The only thing that they do is that they map a hash of a public key to um, to a you know unique name. Since that certificate authority is the binding, what it does is that um, it effectively creates this linking as long as you trust that CA, and you can add multiple certificate authorities and you can have none of these. So this is effectively a um, veneer on top of the existing system. And obviously, you know, you don't actually have to use this. But the good thing about that is that um, it also allows you to effectively uh, purchase a username for a nominal cost to support this project. And um, that is um, that's kind of a nice way to get a flare in the network that allows you to say that you know this that you're supporting this project, and uh, that's effectively what I have. And you can reach out to me uh, in this link, and I'm launching in at the uh, end of uh, August. And um, what this means is that you should be able to actually see this pretty soon. And if you want to uh, know about the project, you can always go to the website and subscribe to the mailing list if you want to do that. And um, this is. Effectively, that I have, and uh, in a couple of brief moments, I will be uh, starting the QA session, and uh, I'll see you in the QA. I hope. See you guys. All right. Um, so um, I have two questions uh, that uh, that's asked, and I want to respond to the uh, memory question first. So um, the answer to that is obviously it depends. Um, I have three separate memory, memory um, questions that I have, the CPU, the memory, and the disk. 
So the easiest is the CPU. Um, as long as you have a processor that's made in, in the last decade, you should be fine. The idea is that you shouldn't be noticing the fact that it is running in the background. So for the memory, um, it actually spikes a lot, but um, the memory used for the backend is around 300 megabytes. And when it's on the pressure, it goes to about 500-ish, but it's usually between 200 and 500. And the front end is actually an electron that's just a code and that effectively depends on um, what uh, Chromium decides to use. So I, I don't have any control over that. But generally speaking, in total, um, I would expect it to be consuming around usually 800-ish megabytes everything is combined. So the idea is that if you have a um, small a VPS on uh, Amazon or DigitalOcean or something like that, you should be able to just draw it in and it should just, you know, effectively work. The second question is um, the neighborhood selection. Uh, it's asking how the neighborhood selected. That parameter determines the range of man's neighborhood is it geography, namespace, or something else? So uh, for the time being, it actually depends on uh, the first connect. So the neighborhood is actually a moving target. So what happens is when you create a neighborhood, it's actually constantly getting new neighbors and ejecting old neighborhoods at, uh, neighbors at the same pace. So what that means is that even if you pick a completely random selection, what you get is that you get a moving, moving target. So um, at this point, it's actually random, and I'll consider it um, something quite similar to Bitcoin in which it actually chooses nodes that are physically distant to you based on your IP address. But it turned out that um, in the testing, that actually reduces the available bandwidth a lot. So that means if you're in the United States, that's going to connect you to a node in uh, Japan or China, and that usually correlates with uh, increased latency. Um, if you have any questions, you guys can ask Larry and um, the guys uh, will transcribe it for me. I'll wait for like 30 seconds. All right, uh, if these are all of the questions, um, thank you guys for, you know, watching me and uh, I, I hope I'll meet you at some place in some time. Thank you.